This is a special day in the life of Trinity Parish. Uh, following the Eucharist today will be our annual meeting. And uh, just to say thank you to all of you that head up departments and programs. We know how much work you have done, and we thank you for putting your reports together, and we look forward to hearing um, the substance of those reports at the meeting immediately following this church service. Um, do we have a time set for it? Is it 11.30, 11, or just right after church? I'm good. Okay. All right. We will be there. Again, welcome, and welcome to those of you watching on Zoom this morning.
Almighty and everlasting God, who govern all things in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson.
For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
The plot and the action move swiftly. Mark wants us to catch the sense of urgency. The kingdom of God, God's powerful presence, is breaking into our ordinary world. How will we respond? In our gospel reading last week, which introduced us to this message of Mark, we were taught to do this. Jesus calls us to do something, and we are not to wait around, but to do something now. And I talked to several of you this week who picked up on the urgency of this message and got the message. So one question for today continues to be, how will we respond? Anyone who reads the first chapter of Mark's Gospel becomes aware that this story is not an ordinary story about an ordinary person. The people of Capernaum learn that pretty quickly in our reading. Jesus enters the synagogue. This is a normal and ritual part of Jesus' traditional Jewish upbringing and heritage. Then Jesus reads from the scriptures and explains the reading brilliantly. What comes next? And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And the conflict and the confrontation is on. Mark's record of the first day of ministry in the life of Jesus makes one point very clear. The will and purpose of God present in Jesus and the will and purpose of evil present in that unclean spirit, that demon, engage in a cosmic battle right there in the midst of those folks, folks like us. And the people respond, what's going on here? Who is this? In this gospel, Mark definitely manages to get the reader's attention and he has shaped the major question of the Gospel. Who is this Jesus? For 15 chapters, Mark will tell us more, give us more information, paint a more poignant picture, but the question never changes. And on Easter morning, when the women stare into the tomb, the question remains, who is this Jesus? What is the source of his authority? Why do evil powers shrink before him? Why does even death fade away under him? Christians have never had concepts or words to adequately answer these questions about our Lord. Human categories cannot contain him. Human language cannot capture or embrace Jesus. To be whole and to be the source of life and to be the source of love. Those qualities are not part of the humanity that we possess. <clears throat> but in Jesus, the ultimate reality you and I call God breaks through. In Jesus, we begin to see that God might be defined for us in the life of this person standing in front of us. We have heard, we believe that God is love, God is life. God is the power that calls us into being. We look at Jesus and we see perfect love, full life, and wholeness in living, the courage to be. Isn't this what God is like? And we wonder about Christ in our lives today. A certain career army officer had been a heavy drinker for 35 years. He had the temperament of a top sergeant long after he became a colonel. That's quite a combination. <laughs> he encountered Christ in his life and his whole life changed. The colonel was speaking once before the staff of a large medical center. He told his story. He told him of this change, his personality change, apparently. How he was now temperate when he had once been intemperate. How he was now considerate as he once had been severe. Concern for others, as he once had been self-centered and self-serving. A psychiatrist who believed that personalities are so firmly set early in life that no one can change like that, protested to the colonel that at his age, a person would not have had such a radical transformation. 
Well, replied the colonel, at least I know I'm under new management. I now answer to another authority, the highest and truest that there is, end quote. Many in the audience that day probably remained skeptical. Several were clearly astonished <coughs> at the transformation of this man's life. The authority of Christ had broken into his world and changed him, and he found new life and wholeness of living. I think it's safe to say that every one of us has some part of our lives and ourselves, some part that could benefit from the inbreaking and healing of Christ's power and authority, every one of us. Unfortunately, much of what happens on a Sunday morning prevents any of us from letting the unimaginable parts of our lives show through as the man did in the synagogue. If we look around, everybody in church looks like they're in control, right? We might even think that everyone but ourselves has the world by the tail and that we are the only wounded ones, the only sick ones, living on the edge. To admit we're not always okay when surrounded by lots of people who are at their Sunday best looking a-okay is not an easy choice. So sometimes we keep our pain and our weakness under cover. But when we do that, we keep them out of the way of Christ's transforming power. I hope that this place, I pretty much know that this place and this family will always be a safe place for each of us to share our brokenness. For it is in bringing the unimaginable parts of our lives to the gospel to the altar, to the people of God, that salvation takes on its real meaning, where the authority of Christ brings wholeness and freedom and life. The people in Capernaum were astonished at Jesus. They said he taught as one who had authority. Who is this? They asked. Because we have seen the holy and mysterious and wonderful power of God in Jesus of Nazareth, we can now witness that same power in Christ here in our lives, in this community, this parish, and this world. Whenever full life and freedom and justice and wholeness of living are found, people are still astonished. We can't go back to Capernaum to witness Jesus' healing of the sick, but we know that Christ's ministry and healing and caring continue to this day. And there are places where the sick and the fearful, the lonely and the brokenhearted find healing and newness of life. May God continue to bless us and grant us grace so that our family and this parish may always be such a place. Amen. Amen. page five in your booklets. <coughs> we now stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in the Father, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternity of God, Through him all things 
May with joy behold your Son in his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able. <coughs> the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Again, welcome and uh, hope that all of you will be staying with us for the annual meeting <coughs> immediately following the service. Steve, do you have any additional announcements for us this morning? No, we will all do it at the annual meeting. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Well, it's covered in the annual meeting. Okay, very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
find in your book list? <laughs>
All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
the post-communion prayer on page 15 in your booklet. Let us pray. The eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as the living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us faith Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the whole world. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.